I try to lead by example. I had a, a thing quite recently where my 16, my middle son, my 16-year-old then, uh, had to go and get his uh, learner's permit. And everybody thinks it's the most boring thing in the world to go, have to go to the to prove what his address was and a passport and this, that and the other. I got there, uh, we queued for about a minute, and I said, uh, look, uh, I take no responsibility for this young man. Uh, he will be a danger to himself and, an and others. If you're going to give him a licence, be it on your head. <laughs> and for identification, I said here to identify him and where he lives is his fine for not having a ticket on the tram. <laughs> Are you leading by example? Did, 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 didn't you teach your kids how to cheat at cards? Uh, no, they eventually picked up that I was cheating. <laughs> Come on, I remember when, one time when you told me, you came, you came, we came over for a coffee and you said, Samuel cheated at cards when he was playing me the other day. I was so proud. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a similar thing. It's like the kids are mad on the Mighty Beans at the moment, yes, right? Yes, the little, yeah, the Mighty Beans. I, absolutely. I, I, I can't figure out why. And they collect them and they swap them. And uh, and he went to school with, like, uh, I think eight Mighty Beans one day and he came home and he opened up his jar. There was only four in them. I said, oh, what's going on there, mate? He said, I, I had 32 Mighty Beans earlier today. I said, what happened? He said, I was gambling. I went... <laughs> <laughs> My boy! My boy! Oh. My oldest daughter uh, the other day accused my oldest son of breaking her iPod. And then, of course, my son denied it. So I explained to her, you know, you can't just accuse someone of doing something unless you have proof. And she says, she looks right up and she said, well, all right, here's your proof. Whoever did this is an idiot, and Nate's an idiot. <laughs> I've got um, five kids from three different women. <laughs> hey, it's, a, no, it's, a, it's OK. I didn't marry the first two. <laughs> but the three that we have at home are Howard, who's ten, and then there's Toby and Elliot, the seven-year-old twins. Now, uh, Toby's my favourite, but I keep Elliot for parts. <laughs> the thing about... <laughs> now, uh, obviously, Steve... Uh, just the five kids. Yeah, I've got five kids. <laughs> just the five. <laughs> My life's a nightmare. My theory is, as soon as you get more than two kids, because with two kids you can hold their hands mm -hmm. one at a time, once you're beyond the two, oh. your life's in chaos. Well, you go from man on man to zone. <laughs> <laughs> With five kids, we used to go up to Port Douglas. And I remember one time we were flying back and we had a little one, and I had her over my shoulder and I was burping her, and suddenly I see all this action up and down the aisle, and I'm going, geez, what's going on there? You know, still burping her. What has happened is, <laughs> mad, while I'm burping, her head's gone over the back of the seat and she's vomited into the bloke's meal. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's trying to... And I'm going, geez, I wonder what... That's all the action. <laughs> and he's yeah, there going... everyone else is going, oh, jeez. <laughs> I ordered the kosher meal. <laughs> Well, yeah. Tim, uh, your, your kids are older now. In, well, they certainly in, are. In fact, your 21-year-old daughter recently got engaged. Yes, oh, indeed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm glad they're clapping, because you ain't. <laughs> I was a bit surprised, shocked. <laughs> no, no, I'm very excited. Uh, I like the son-in-law. Um, it means that my wife is now... Granny Smith. She's <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I can see the look on her face. <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember when she was in her teens, I said to her, "Oh, um, so Ali, um, what are you up to today?" And she went, "Well, Dad, actually, I'm minding my own fucking business." <laughs> Uh, so what are you doing? And I went, well, actually, I'm throwing an ungrateful mole out into the street. <laughs> well, uh, well, my kids are a lot younger, so they're, they're still at the really cute age, and they are oh, both really cute. Oh. And uh, I get this thing where I, I'm out with my kids, and people come out and go, oh, Trev, they are beautiful kids. And I go, oh, thank you, thanks so much. They go, geez, your wife must be good looking. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, this bit we're about to see, Jim, uh, you went for the extended Brazilian, let's call it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. We were at, uh, we were at uh, Sydney during Mardi Gras and there was a sign for 
back crack and sack wax. Ah. And I decided to go and get a back sack and crack wax. Oh, <laughs> oh. That's a very vulnerable position, that I tell you. Oh, hello. Oh. Over. <laughs> Sometimes our whole testicle came off. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing about this is he lets his mate watch him. <laughs> What's going on? Come on in! I'm getting his dumb done. <laughs> they do that, that really, that, that, what is it called, uh, the, the, the spab? No. That's the space between your ass and balls. And that, that, oh, that was a little bad. That's got a name. Yeah. Perineum would be, you know. Perineum? Yeah. Yeah, well, foot's great, it's spat. Yeah. And that's really... <laughs> Yeah. What about those guys that came over, those knife-throwing guys? Oh, the knife-throwing oh, guys, yes. ones? They were, the, they were the proudest, best Russian knife-throwers from Georgia. And they were, they were, they were, they were classic knife-throwers. They'd been brought in at huge expense. And their big act was, uh, we, had a, we did the weather, so they were going to throw knives into a map of Australia. <laughs> and, and when they did uh, Brisbane... Uh, uh, we'd say Brisbane, but because they didn't speak English, we were told we needed to bring an interpreter in so they knew which city to throw the knives at. It's very complex. So at huge expense, we've, we brought a translator down from uh, Canberra who could speak Russian. So we got the Cossacks there with their knives all ready to go and a map of Australia for the weather. I went to uh, Sydney and the Russian translator goes, Sydney! <laughs> So the bloke throws. <laughs> <laughs> Missed the bloody board completely. <laughs> he took out, took out the floor manager. So I thought, well, maybe Sydney's the same, because we paid a fortune for this bastard to come down from here. I've gone, Brisbane. Brisbane! <laughs> we went around the whole of Australia with this bloke repeating every city in a Russian accent and not one knife stuck in the bloody floor. <laughs> Well, one show that uh, you worked on that was deliberately funny, yeah. and very much so, was uh, Ali G. Yeah, Ali, the American version of Ali G. OK, let's uh, just have a look at uh, a bit of Ali G. So does vets mainly look after sick animals? No, we do a lot of preventive medicine, reproductive work and everything. Why was there so many sick animals in Vietnam? That's <laughs> coming. <laughs> there, there wasn't that many sick animals in Vietnam. But weren't there like millions of Vietnam vets? <laughs> okay, a veterinarian is a doctor of veterinary medicine. He's a person that treats animals. For will. So, ah, it's getting it. So, loads of people went to Vietnam and then treated animals. There. No, no, no. God. You're confusing the term. All right. I'm a veteran, right. but I'm also a veterinarian because I served time as a veterinarian in the military. For will. So why do so many of those people from the military then later on in life want to start working with animals? <laughs> a lot of people watch that and they look at it and go, oh, is it set up? Is it... No, it's not set up. Those are real. No one knows that... Uh, yeah, it's horrible. It's and there are phone calls to the producers, the poor woman who sets up all these, she's a genius, sets up all these interviews and after the interviews, there's kind of this confused period, this foggy period, where the, the interview subject calls and will say, hey, uh, uh, Jen, um, yeah, I think the interview went well. Uh, <laughs> uh, just had a few questions. Do you mind, mind giving me a call? I just, uh... and, you know, and, of course, she doesn't return the calls. What's the point? Yeah. They've signed the release. Yeah, it's yeah like, the release yeah, has yeah. been signed. The next call is, hey, Jen, uh, yeah, I've been thinking a little more about the interview. I uh, still haven't heard back from you. <laughs> call me. <laughs> and then the third call, and this is our favorite call, is just, you see, that's all, just the C word. Yeah. It's just the person calling Jen the C word. Yeah, so that's the, that's the build, yeah. What other jobs have you done, uh, gentlemen, Jeff? Well, my first job, I think the first job I ever did was as a glass collector. 
I used to collect glasses in a pub in a place called Wrexham in North Wales. It was a theme pub. The theme was fighting. <laughs> and um, I'd be there going, is that glass dead? Which one? The one in your head there, sir. <laughs> and um, then I worked for BOC. That was when I was an engineer, selling oxygen and acetylene to welders. Then I got fed up with the glamour of that and uh, <laughs> moved into show business. I didn't, but went to my first comedy show in 1987. Sat down and watched it at the comedy store and went, oh, this is what I want to do. So I'd be like 23, and then I did my first gig in 1988, April 1988, uh, and, and I, I don't know if I died, but there was a whiff of embalming fluid backstage. <laughs> and, um, what, and about, uh, what about your parents at that point? What did they say when you said, I'm going to become a comedian? <laughs> my mum cried. Because uh, <laughs> they'd seen... Which is me... not really what Ooh. you want no. as a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> because now they see you on television mm. and all that kind of stuff, they, they forget the fact that they didn't really want me to go into it. But, um, but the family pretty weird, though. You know, the, the, the support levels are always kind of funny when you were trying to do comedy. Like, my sister was talking to me on the phone and she was talking about something tragic that had happened and she went, yeah, that's not that funny. Um, speaking, of, <laughs> speaking of not that funny, I saw you on Spicks and Specs the other night. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Cole? Did you uh, do any other jobs before you did uh, comedy? Yeah, I was about 18, I think, and uh, met Frank uh, and Scott, this other guy. We were in a trio for, uh, for about three or four Which years. So you found objects? Found yeah, objects, yes. Them. Scott, after about four or five years, um, I don't know, just kind of got the shits with this. I don't know. He moved to Alice Springs with his wife and then Frank and I kind of panicked for a few months, then realised that we could uh, move on and call a, a, ourselves a duo. And to come up with a name, we needed something that made it look like we'd been together for ages, like we are an established act, so that's why we did the Lano and Woodley thing. And my nickname at school was uh, Lano, but um, Frank's uh, nickname at school was unfortunately Franger. So um, <laughs> anyway, we went with uh, Woodley instead. Um, we were together for about uh, 20 years and it got to the stage where we'd get to the airport to get on a flight and the person checking you in would say, um, we won't be able to sit you together. And we both, as one, just to go, that's fine, that's OK. <laughs> Is it Start a bit like breaking up a marriage yeah. when you go through that? It kind of was because the reason that we did break up was because uh, I did sleep with his wife. <laughs> um, so, um, and, 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 and it wasn't that good. Um, no, no, see, it's all, you know, it's all right that I sleep with his wife, but when it was bad sex, people go, ah, oh, that's disgusting. Uh, when I first came here, I worked in construction sites, so you don't work in the rain. We got rained off at 9.30, uh, went back to this guy's house in North Sydney, mm -hmm. and I was staying in Bondi. So at 12 o'clock, I had to leave sideways to go back to Bondi, and you've got to change trains at Town Hall, get a different train. So I'm going over the bridge. Uh, the last stop was Winyard. Winyard to Town Hall is the shortest stop, like the front of the train. Mm. Is yeah. in Town Hall in the back of the yeah, train, yeah. it's still in Winyard. It's <laughs> really, like, close. I yeah. thought, I've made it, I've done it. I, can so I just did that, and I'm in Parramatta. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, I went, no way! <laughs> I'm <in> Parramatta. <laughs> and then looked at all the stops, I've stopped up, and thought, no way, and then got, I thought, and I'm really tired. I got back on the train again to go back into Central, fell asleep, woke up, and Hertzville, which is <laughs> the far end of South, and then it got all, I got all the way back into Central. By well, the time I got to Central, the trains had stopped running. I had to get a taxi home. <laughs> Couldn't get to sleep. I've been, I slept the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> well, Russ, uh, you obviously had uh, plenty of jobs before you started in comedy. As a teenager, obviously, you were a rent boy. But uh, before, <laughs> that, <laughs> before that, uh, I have a little photo Damn here. Oh, yeah. this radio. That is uh, Russell Gilbert working on the mutton chain at Bothwick's. Yeah, Bothwick's. You... I was a... I was a butcher for nearly eight years. I used to bone sheep. It was your job to bone sheep? Oh, no, that sounds worse. No, that, that sounds worse than... Uh, well, once at a Christmas party, that was, we had a couple. We had a bit of a crack. But um, just the once. Um, don't do it with pigs. They're worse. They squeal on you. They tell everyone. <laughs> oh, man. We had, we had a lot of fun, and there was, there was lots of different nationalities, a lot of Yugoslavians and uh, Albanians, Turkish, Maltese. And uh, well, they used to call me Buldala, the Yugoslavians, which means stupid. And the Maltese, they were the best. Because uh, they had a different word for everything. And they sing, you know, Razil, how are you going? He's a good horse, he won't be beaten. <laughs> and I'd see Joe and I said, I saw your brother at the football. And he'd look at me and go, did you went? <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, your brother was there. He said, did you see him? <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, did you spoke to him? 
I said, yeah, he said, what did he say? Like, four words in a row, wrong, and then he'd fart and go, ha oh, you hear the smell? <laughs> then I was a motorbike courier, and then I went to La Joke, and I started watching blokes like you, and you took me under your wing, and you talked me into doing stand-up, and made me get up for my first ever stand-up, because I was driving Trevor mad. Well, the thing is, like, you know, when, you, when you're working a small room like we were at La Joke, is yeah. that you look out in the audience, and you like to see different faces there, because you, your material's not changing from night to night. I was looking down, I see this guy every night <laughs> in the audience, and he came up to me in the bar one night, at Russell, and he said, oh, hey, okay, mate, I said, what are you doing here every night? He said, I want to be a comic. I went, oh, that's all right then. <laughs> <laughs> you actually came to the Kamikaze Cafe. There was that's a gig we used to do yeah. up there. We used to have an, an open mic section in there. And uh, I reckon you came uh, every Thursday for about six months. And yeah. I, I'd see you then. You'd go, okay, you're going to get up tonight? And you go, oh, yeah, maybe. And then the time I come, you're getting up. Oh, no, 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 no. And then one night I just walked in and went, you, get ready. You're on tonight. And you went, Right, I can't. <laughs> you got up and you kicked ass the first night and you never looked back. No, but you helped me and I appreciate that. And I Mate, really uh, my Would very you like great... to get a room, you two? Yeah. We've had a room. We've had a room. Oh, don't worry. Plenty of people have never forgiven me about it. <laughs> It's an obvious topic for comedy, but uh, out there in Cabland, mm. uh, there's hard yards, you'd have to say. Oh, it's tough out there at the moment, isn't it? Well, it's, it's not really a, a thing I enjoy as a chick hopping in a cab, I no. have to say. And um, I left a, um, a baby shower once, and I got in the cab and it was, he f was full on Metallica, really, really up, super loud for the entire trip. And he finally pulled out outside my house, he goes, Oh, sorry, I forgot to ask. Do you like Metallica? <laughs> <laughs> I actually used to drive cabs. Is that right? Oh, really? Yeah, years ago. Yeah. Um, you're looking at Don 2 -O. <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, this is the fact of the matter. This is a million years before the war. Um, <laughs> um, when I was driving cabs, I picked up Daryl once, Daryl Summers and uh, took him to an audition for a show called Opportunity Knox, which I was auditioning for as well. <laughs> Sandy. So I dropped him off, and then, you know, Dr. Rand got changed, came in. He was a bit shocked. He, uh, <laughs> you know, the cab driver's auditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's trying to get in the show. But, <laughs> but he's never really let me forget that. So there you go, this is yeah. story. Timbo, I, I like to drive myself, and I always... I feel that I'm being ripped off by cab drivers. They always take the long way. And I'm always smashed when I get in them. And, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really defensive when I, I, I sit in the back and, like, I'm, I'm glare at the guy in the mirror and stuff. And I, and I close one eye and try and, like, make sure that it's the same guy in the picture. <laughs> I got in this cab and this guy, I was, uh, I was just sort of, I was a bit floppy, had a few beers, and I, <laughs> the, he takes off and he's doing, he's doing, sometimes you get a cab driver who just works his accelerator all the time, so you have to go, eh. oh. <laughs> always when you've had too much to drink. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing that? <laughs> uh, that's my style. <laughs> you keep on going, I will barf in your car to read it. Didn't stop him. <laughs> evil, yeah. evil, evil, evil man. I get cabs all the time. I, uh, I don't drive. And uh, I've done this breakfast radio show in Sydney. I've done Wendy Harmer's uh, breakfast show for the last year and a half that was on air. And... Um, a lot of people said to me in the year following that, when I'd be in Sydney, they'd say, she used to be really mean to you on air, you know, she was really mean to you, because she was pretty hardcore with me. Like, I'd say something on the show, and she'd just go, that's not even funny. You know, <laughs> so people used to say to me, oh, wow, she's, she was really mean to you, and I used to feel good about that. One day I'm in a cab, driving along the cab, and the guy goes, I didn't you used to be in that uh, Wendy Harmer breakfast show? And I went, yeah, yeah, I did. And he went, you wrecked that show. <laughs> Just kept on driving. He wasn't, he wasn't insulting me, he was just telling me a fact. Give me the fact. Let's go for Lost in Translation. Greg, I know for a fact that you've had a bit of a scrape overseas. Yeah, I have, and I'll try and get this through this really quickly because it's a long story, but I basically end up getting kidnapped in, in Bangkok and defrauded of a whole lot of money and then escaping from those people and crossing illegally into Burma and ending up in the middle of a civil war. 
then I went away for a two-week holiday to relax. Right? <laughs> Basically, went to um, Bangkok, walked out of my hotel, and all these people sort of swamped me, as people quite often do in, in some of those places, where they're going, come with me, I'll show you this, and, you know, no, I'll but show no, you this. But normally, uh, their brother owns a jewellery store. There was a lot of that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. But this other guy came out and went, you know, he yelled out something in Thai and clapped his hands, and everyone went away. And then he went, I'm so sorry, and I'm so sorry, I hate seeing people treated that way in my country, you know, I, it's embarrassing, I'm so sorry, you know, please enjoy your stay here. And I was like, oh, man, that's fine, they were, they were okay. And he says, would you like to go and have a drink? So we go and have a soft drink. And early in the conversation, he says to me, look, my sister's going to Australia. She's a nurse. She's going as an exchange student. You know, can you tell me about Australia? So I'm like, oh, of course. You know, da, da. And he said, when she goes there, what sort of credit card should we give her? And I, you know, I said, oh, it doesn't matter. Any of the major ones, you know, they all work. And he said, well, for example, what sort do you use? Oh. Bow, bow. <laughs> that was a little clue there. And so I said, oh, I've got a diner's club. Now, had I said I don't have one, the whole thing would have been over. He would have gone, oh, well, nice to meet you, and left. So he ascertained that I had a credit card, and then it just got out of control. He took me, you know, for a couple of days, showed me around, then asked me to come and meet his family and meet his sister at their house. So I did that in the outer suburbs of Bangkok. Cut a long story short, I ended up getting withheld by these people, and they kept doing things to me. It was so weird, because every time I'd start really freaking out, and they'd say to me, look, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, you don't know where you are. And I'd think... Oh, God, I don't know where I am. <laughs> and then they go, you're thinking, no one knows that you're here. And I think, oh, God, no one knows that I'm here. And then he'd say, if I wanted to do something bad to you, I could just go next door and get the axe and cave your head in with it. But I'm not going to do that. And I'd go, oh, my God, he's got an axe next door. And they kept me there for a couple of days, ended up getting four grand out of me. It's a long story how that all happened. And I was convinced they were going to kill me, escaped. And, uh, and the great thing was when I escaped, finally they left me in this room and they said, we'll come back to get you. And I was convinced they were going to come and kill me. And I kept going through this thing where I'd like accept it. I'd just go, all right, I'm going to get killed. And then I'd go, no, I'm going to hide over there. When the first guy comes in, I'll kick him. I'll hit the other guy with a toaster and I'll, you know, like. But in the morning, I just got up and I thought, I might as well try and escape. So I just got up, got my stuff and just ran. And they said, don't leave this room, whatever you do. Everyone who works here works for me and, you know, we'll catch you. So I just got up and ran, ran out the front, got out the front of this place. And this group of about eight young guys who were all sitting on the front of cars, really crimey looking guys, got up when I came out and they all just started coming towards me. And I took my bag off, threw it at the first guy and hit him in the legs and just went, what do you want, man? What do you want? I said, I'm not taking this. What do you want? And he went, taxi? <laughs> and I went, oh, sorry, yeah. So basically, so, you know, got so you away. you had eight taxis outside yeah. that room the whole time? Yeah, I could have got away at any time. <laughs> yeah, got away with them and then uh, ended up meeting up with this friend of mine in Bangkok by accident. And she said, oh, come and meet me. I'm staying in this town up on the, the border of Burma. It's really lovely. So I went and crossed into Burma and ended up hiking up through this place and uh, into this camp where she was working. She didn't bother telling me that they were currently being shelled by the Burmese military. The all Burmese student democratic front were fighting a war against government. We're getting shelled. They kept bringing me all these different guns and going, shoot this into a tree. And I was like, you know, and trying to act like I wasn't loving it. But it was uh, not as relaxing a holiday as I would have liked. <laughs> but you know, still, I'd do it again. <laughs> you know, Greg, when we're doing this, if you haven't got a good story, you can just. <laughs>